Hi class, Dr. Linder. Let's take a look at neurotransmitters and their effects. So neurotransmitters, their effects can be manipulated or modified. They can be modified by vitamins, by minerals, by herbs, by medications, pharmaceuticals. There's lots of different ways of enhancing or inhibiting or manipulating neurotransmitters effects. So their synthesis, right, the production of it can be stimulated or inhibited. The release of them can be inhibited or stimulated. The removal of them can be stimulated or blocked. Or you can manipulate and play around with the receptor sites that can be blocked or activated. So there's different ways of influencing and having an impact on the neurotransmitters, the production, the release, the removal, and the receptor sites. Certain neurotransmitters are referred to as agonists and some are called antagonists. An agonist is anything that enhances a neurotransmitter's effect. An antagonist is one that's going to block it or do the opposite. So we're going to look at uh, different types of neurotransmitters. Some of them are small molecule neurotransmitters like acetylcholine, amino acids, some biogenic amines, ATP, nitric oxide, carbon monoxide, right? So some of these small molecule neurotransmitters, if you look at them, their structures, even their biochemical structures are different, which means they're going to function different. So acetylcholine is one that you'll hear of. Nitric oxide is important. Glutamate is very important. GABA, uh, norepinephrine, epinephrine, dopamine, serotonin. So these fall under different categories, like the amino acids. Glutamate is an amino acid, and aspartate is an amino acid, and gamma amino butyric acid, or GABA, and glycine. These are amino acids. And this is where we need a lot of B vitamins in order to manufacture these, as well as the bioagenic amines from norepinephrine to epinephrine to dopamine to serotonin. There is a pathway. Let's see if I can draw this out for you. It goes phenylalanine, phenylalanine to tyrosine. and then tyrosine to dopamine. To dopamine, and then dopamine to norepinephrine and norepinephrine to epinephrine. So this is kind of a flow of how our body can manufacture from amino acids we can make these neurotransmitters from phenylalanine. It's really important. Phenylalanine has to be metabolized and we can produce tyrosine. And tyrosine is really important because tyrosine can attach to four iodines and you get T4, which is a thyroid hormone called thyroxine. And dopamine, dopamine, is a neurotransmitter that helps you feel good. Dopamine helps you feel good. It's that part of that reward cascade system. Dopamine is also involved with muscle contractions. Dopamine is also involved with different types of addictions. Uh, chocolate increases dopamine. Sex increases dopamine. Chocolate increases dopamine. Eating increases dopamine. Gambling increases dopamine. Alcohol increases dopamine. And that's what makes a lot of behaviors addictive is because people like to feel good. So if sex makes you feel good, people want more of it. And this is where you have your sex addict.
Smoking can increase dopamine levels. So people want to smoke more. Chocolate, eating, right? So the most dangerous one, the most dangerous type of addiction and the more, most difficult one to break is probably eating addictions because eating is needed for survival. Alcohol is not needed for you to survive. Sex, although enjoyable, is not needed for you to survive, but food and water is needed for your survival. If someone is an alcoholic and they just have a taste of alcohol on their tongue, it triggers it. So that's what makes that addiction difficult. Someone that's eating, they could just put a little taste of food on their tongue, and that's what uh, brings out a lot of these disorders. Norepinephrine and epinephrine, norepinephrine, um, is involved in um, your mood. It's involved in sleeping. Um, epinephrine is involved with um, anger issues. So people who are easy to trigger have issues in this pathway, norepinephrine and epinephrine. You also need vitamin C in order to make these conversions from norepinephrine to epinephrine. If there's an imbalance in these, this is when you start to have sleeping issues, uh, mood disorders, anger issues, and the more stressed you are, the more stressed you are, when you're under stress, your vitamin C becomes depleted. Vitamin C is needed under stress, but the more stress you're under, the more norepinephrine your body's gonna push out when you're under stress, you start to break down and utilize the vitamin C. And there becomes this dysregulation here between norepinephrine and epinephrine. Okay. Um, phenylalanine to tyrosine. This is why when babies are born, they pinprick their feet. They take their blood and they're looking to see if they have a genetic condition called PKU, phenylketonuronics, PKU. It's the inability to properly metabolize phenylalanine. That becomes a problem. If you look at a lot of the soda today, it'll say warning contains phenol ketonuronics. So people that have that disease have to be very, very careful. Um, people that use diet soda, diet Coke, diet Sprite, diet Snapple, a lot of those diet products have aspartame in it. And aspartame can downregulate these conversions, especially right here. It'll block phenylalanine to tyrosine. So a lot of people that use these diet products end up getting thyroid issues because they can't convert phenylalanine to tyrosine without tyrosine. Tyrosine with four iodines is T4, thyroxine. So you have to be careful with these uh, artificial sweeteners like aspartame. It's very, very sweet. I don't know, some sources say 8,000 to 10,000 times uh, sweeter than sugar, but the aspartame doesn't uh, create an insulin spike like sugar does. Okay, so you want to be careful with NutraSweet, Sweet and Low, um, uh, Splenda, Sucralose, all of those things damage this. And believe it or not, they've done so many studies on like People that drink regular Coke versus Diet Coke. No one that's drank Diet Coke has ever lost weight. When they do comparisons side by side, these people that use these diet products typically gain more weight than the person drinking the regular stuff. Okay, so you want to be very careful with that. So acetylcholine, we mentioned this when we talked about the neuromuscular junction. That's always excitatory. It's always an excitatory neuromuscular, um, an excitatory transmitter at the neuromuscular junction. It could be inhibitory at other areas, but at the neuromuscular junction, it's always, always, always excitatory. And the way the body degrades acetylcholine is by using acetylcholine esterase. Anything that ends in ACE is an enzyme. Glutamate and GABA, these are really important. Glutamate is excitatory in the brain. And glutamate is what's needed to get you up in the morning. When your alarm goes off and you get up, 
glutamate, think of glutamate as the blossoming flower as the sun rises. And I want you to think of GABA as the flower closing. So we have glutamate that can be converted to GABA. This is in the morning. This is in the evening. Glutamate wakes you up. GABA helps you sleep. So when your alarm goes off and glutamate does its thing, you can get out of bed, you can shower, you can do your stuff. As the day progresses, you work, you study. Then in the evening comes 7, 8, 9, 10 o'clock, glutamate gets converted to GABA and we need B vitamins to do that, especially B1, as well as B6. They can make that conversion into GABA. And GABA helps to um, tone you down a little bit at night and calm your brain and mind so you can sleep. Now, there are some people who are glutamate deficient in the morning, where they wake up and they hit the snooze button over and over and over, and they drag themselves to get out of bed. It could be because they're deficient in their B vitamins, or they just they make uh, antibodies against glutamate. There are some people that can make antibodies that attack their own glutamate. Then there are people that are glutamate dominant at night, where they don't have GABA at night, they have glutamate at night, and these are the people whose brains are wired at night and they can't sleep. So it's, uh, you know, getting these neurotransmitters checked are important. So glutamate is excitatory. That's the opening of the flower. GABA is the inhibitory. Uh, if you've heard of Valium, Valium, which is a drug, it comes from valerian root. It's a very important herb. I use it quite a bit in my practice to help uh, with muscle spasms and to help calm down a lot of patients. The valerian root or Valium is a GABA agonist meaning it brings on and enhances GABA's job. So what is GABA? GABA is an inhibitory neurotransmitter. So Valium or valerian root helps to enhance the inhibitory effect of GABA so it calms people down. When they have to go into a closed space, maybe someone is claustrophobic, they can't go in an MRI machine, they, they're afraid of going on an airplane, they'll use Valium to calm them down. They have to go to a hospital for a medical procedure, they'll use this to calm them down. Um, ATP and other purines, these are excitatory in the central neural system and the peripheral neural system. Certain gases like NO, nitric oxide, these are formed from an amino acid called arginine. So arginine is the precursor to nitric oxide. There are a lot of athletes that use arginine. Um, a lot of bodybuilders use it, a lot of professional athletes that need endurance because nitric oxide is considered to be a vaso dilator it opens up the blood vessel bringing more um, oxygen and red blood cells to a given area okay so where does nitric oxide come from the precursor is called arginine it was first recognized as a vasodilator when you vasodilate you can lower blood pressure What is Viagra? Viagra is a form of nitric oxide. It vasodilates the blood vessels of the penis, creating an erection, okay? All right, we spoke about the some of these bioagenic amines like norepinephrine, dopamine. Um, I don't know if I mentioned serotonin, I know we mentioned dopamine, it's involved in regulating um, skeletal muscle tone. And that's why when people have Parkinson's disease, Parkinson's disease is a dopamine deficiency in the midbrain. Um, people have these movement disorders where they get these moving tremors. When they start to move their body, 
they start to get these shakes. Um, with Parkinson's disease, they get this like mask-like um, expressionless look on their face. They have this festinating gait, which means when they when they're standing still, they have trouble initiating movement, walking. So they have to lean forward like they're going to fall. And when they fall, their feet move really, really quick. That's called a festinating gait. That's typically seen with Parkinson's disease. Norepinephrine is needed for regulating mood. And it also helps with sleep. Serotonin also involved with mood and sleep. Um, this one, what's interesting about serotonin, a lot of people don't know this, is that 80 to 90 percent of the receptors are found in the gut, not in the brain, but it's, it's claimed to fame is that it's a neurotransmitter that helps people feel really good. Um, and this is why you can really help um, with feeling good based on the foods that the person's eating and the microbiome of the gut. Uh, if eight and 90% of the receptors are in the gut, your digestion and gut play a major impact on how you feel. And that's why we'll always ask people, we'll always ask people, what's your mood after eating the food? Okay. Um, when there's too much serotonin, this is when people run to the bathroom. When there's too little serotonin, then they're constipated. So when people have irritable bowel disease or they have irritable bowel syndrome, it's this up and down of serotonin where they're running to the bathroom and then they're constipated and they could be running to the bathroom and then they could be constipated. Um, so it's really important to eat healthy, to make sure that you're eating real whole foods so that your gut is healthy. It also explains why people don't feel well when they're sick, right? Their moods aren't the best because when they're sick, uh, their gut is affected, their stomach hurts, their serotonin levels are off, they're running to the bathroom, they're constipated. So um, again, these neurotransmitters are very important. The neuropeptides, uh, substance P, enkephalons, angiotensin II, cholecystokinin, um, these are important, especially these right here. Um, substance P, this is found in sensory neurons. The P is for like substance pain or perception of pain. It is enhance and enhances pain perception, okay? Substance P. Um, and kephalons, these are going to block substance P. So enkephalons are going to inhibit the pain impulses by suppressing the release of substance P. Uh, this is why a lot of people do acupuncture. It is very well documented that they increase enkephalons and why acupuncture helps with pain management. So substance P enhances your perception of pain. It stimulates histamine release. Substance P is going to stimulate histamine release from mast cells. So if we can block substance P, you're going to feel better. And there's lots of ways of doing that. Sometimes people use a topical analgesic. Have you ever used, let's say, biofreeze before? Biofreeze, something you spray on, let's say, a, a sprained ankle or a sore neck or a lower back spasms. And all of a sudden it feels really hot, really cold, really hot, really cold. And it's like really nagging and it bothers you because that topical analgesic is the substance P, right? Like your, your perception is in heightened because the substance P stimulates histamine release from mast cells. And histamine is involved in vasodilating, 
vasodilating blood vessels, cr uh, creating other cytokines, creating more pain, but all of a sudden, the mast cells get burned out. There's no more histamine to be released because the biofreeze pushed out all the substance P already. And all of a sudden you go, huh, I feel better. My neck feels better or my lower back feels better because this really brought all of this stuff out till there was none left. So it kind of like tricks the system. Um, and kephalons, these are... Uh, pain relieving, again, how it blocks substance P. And acupuncture, as well as chiropractic, both of these are known to stimulate enkephalins. And it's much, much better than using opioids, that's for sure. And, and risking uh, an addiction, for sure. So... Um, Okay, let's pause here for a second. See if there's any questions on that.